The first things I want to show you in this rather brutal comparison between Adobe Photoshop on the iPad and Affinity Photo on the iPad is its life in the App Store. Now these are only available obviously on the iPad. Now you can see there that Adobe Photoshop is uh, full of nice pictures, ratings, reviews, very poor ratings actually, but we won't go there. I'm looking at the version history. Five days ago, there was an update. Um, we fixed an issue where raw files were unable to be imported. In other words, up until five days ago, you couldn't use raw images. They fixed those issues where, and they fixed some other issues where users were actually unable to log in. Now, is that new to Adobe or not? I've seen that over the years. Three months ago, there was another update. We have some exciting updates in this month's release. Generative Expand, powered by Adobe Firefly. So I'm not quite sure what the relationship there is, but they're obviously shoehorning AI into Photoshop for iPad. They better do something because there's not much else in it. Three months ago, there's more. 5.3, you can now add or remove content from your images non-destructively. Oh, isn't that beaut? Four months ago, you can see a pattern developing here. You can now remove an entire object with the new remove tool. That's one thing they fixed that month and they hope you enjoy the update. Five months ago, another update. You can you now use camera as a raw filter, camera raw as a filter to easily make adjustments on any layer and on any file type. Mm, okay. Six months ago, we have some exciting updates this month. You can now modify generative fill layers, fiddling with AI again. Import your Lightroom photos directly into Photoshop on the iPad from both the home screen or using the place tool. Mm -hmm. The new look of the colour picker makes it easier to sample colours. Well, that's probably useful. Have a great September and keep creating. Um, well, you won't be doing too much of that with Photoshop on the iPad. Seven months ago, we're at 4.8. Happy July. You can now push, pull, rotate, reflect, pucker and bloat any area of your image with the liquify filter. So you can see the pattern here eight months ago, nine months ago, no more there at all. What you read is what you see. Ten months ago, the latest update brings you what? Text properties, improvements to the user interface, and a bug fix has been added to address an issue that arose from the previous update. Hmm, sounds interesting. 11 months ago and one year ago. Okay, one year ago, one year ago, a lot of updates came out a year ago. New tutorials, changes and fixes. Some bug fixes, not a lot happening. Two years ago, information, new update coming. Two years ago, which is about when it came out actually, new update coming. Now, what you still can't do in, a, in um, Adobe Photoshop for iPad is anything useful, like you can on the desktop. Okay, the desktop tool, having been around for years, should be at a very usable stage. And for a lot of people, it is. I mean, it's become a verb in the, in the English language. You can Photoshop something. Now, if that's not market penetration, I don't know what is. And Adobe's very good at that. Let's go back and search for Affinity. We're doing a comparison here, remember? Affinity Photo 2 for iPad. That's the baby we want. There it is there. Version history. We're at version 2.4. Version 2.4 is here, free to all customers. There's a whole range of stuff there. 
Two months ago, there was an update. Three months ago, Spiral Tool was added. Five months ago, a whole bunch of stuff added there. Long press, decimal places, a lot of fixes fixed. Now, nine months ago, version 2.1 was out. Look at the list of things there. 2 2.4, 2.3, 2.2, 2.1. Too many things. And one year ago, 2.1, uh, 2.0 was released. Prior to that, you had 2.1, uh, sorry, version 1 of Affinity Photo, which is not listed on here for obvious reasons. It's too early, and even in its worst stage, its worst iteration, Affinity Photo version 1 is still better than Adobe Photo Shop for iPad whatever version it's up to now, 5.5, I think. And you could still do more with version 1 of Affinity Photo than you can now with 5.5 of Photoshop. Now, let's go and have a look. Affinity Photo, well, of course, I've got it on here. But you can buy a photo, Affinity Photo for iPad license for £12.49. That's one off. You can buy the whole universal license, that's all apps and all platforms and no subscription, for £112. That means you can put it on any iPad you own, any PC you own and any Mac you own. You can run it on all three or all, all of them at the same time and all versions at the same time. No big deal. That's about as cheap as you're going to get. Reviews, lots of reviews there. Okay, let's go back to let's go back to Photoshop. Photo mm, okay. S H O P Photoshop for iPad. And we'll see what that is. Ten pound a month. Now, I don't know how many months are in your year, but I've got 12 months in my year. That's £120 or $240 a year. That's not one off. That's a year. For a program, that's virtually useless because it's nice to play with, but it doesn't do much. Now, we've got 10,000 ratings there, and the highest one is a five-star rating. What a load of rubbish. Sort by most helpful, I don't think so. Sort by most critical, one star ratings. One star ratings, one star ratings, one star ratings. Uh, we're still going down, one star ratings. One star ratings. There are not a lot of happy people there. So if you're comparing the two, don't go any further than the App Store, because the App Store will tell you everything you want to know. Now, what's going to happen when I click on the Open tab in this, because I did have a subscription, um, but I haven't anymore. So you tap on Open, and for subs you, you need an internet connection, because it's fetching subscription details, and guess what? It's expired. Build yearly or build monthly, 788.99 a year. So they do it for you cheaper by the year. But if you want to pay 78, 79 quid every year for a program that mostly you can't use for anything useful, well, good luck to you. And you can do the same monthly if you like. Now, fortunately, I've already done this. Let's go back to the App Store, but not with a, uh, I did have Affinity Photo, um, Photoshop for iPad, sorry, getting them all mixed up there, aren't I?
affinity photo. There we go there. Now, $12.49. Well, for a whole year, for all three licenses, that's the Mac, the iPad, the PC, and also all of the apps. That's photo, designer, and publisher. You get all three for £112, and that's forever. Free updates, um, you name it. There's previews. Now, let's have a look at the ratings and reviews. See all. Sort by most helpful. Sort by most critical. There's a few one-star reviews there. Let's see how far down they scroll. Uh, already we're up to two stars and three stars. And now we're into five stars. There is very few critical reviews on this. Sort by most recent. There we go, five star, three, few, three stars. And you'll find if you read a lot of those, a lot of those reviews, a lot of them are by people who actually can't use the program really well, but are learning. Now, what happens if I open it? Easy. It opens. It's not doing a strange license check. And there's the thumbnail for this particular video. Isn't that lovely? And that's done on Affinity Photo version 2.4, which is the latest version out. Now, let's have a look at these two programs in action, shall we? Photoshop on the iPad first, and then Affinity Photo. Now, let's have a quick look at the user interface. As soon as you open a document, you'll enter into the editing workspace and your creative work can begin. So let's open that one there. The canvas displays the area where you interact with your open document. Photoshop on the iPad offers you a context-aware user interface. Core tools and tool options are contextual and surface only when you need them. So let's look at the tool options. If we go to the top, that's the Select or Move tool. You can control the settings of your selected tools using the tool options. <clears throat> Tap the tool icon to bring up the tool options. Now I've just tapped the Move one and there's some options. Auto Select Layer on the Canvas. Individual Layer or Group. Now I just want Individual Layer. And you can see that with that selected, it selects the canvas, but it also selects the first layer. Now, on an open document screen, you find the header bar, which is obviously up the top. B, the toolbar, which we just used the first one. C is the tool options. That's the little options that come up beside it. D is the touch shortcut. And E is the taskbar. And F is the panel options. There's the panel options over that side and the taskbar on the right hand side. You can now see labels added to tool icons in the workspace when working on your images in Photoshop on the iPad. Just hover over the icons and you'll be able to see what the icons mean. This hover, hover mode is not available on lesser powered iPads like mine. Mine doesn't show that, but if you've got one of the new iPads with the M2 uh, chip in it and like that, then you'll be able to see it. Use the colour picker to create colour palettes and swatches and think of new and creative ways to use colour in your creative work. Tap the colour chip to open the colour panel and you'll find the colour picker. And there we go there, there's the colour picker. And that's selected the colour. You can see it in that round bar there, round circle there. From there, you can adjust your colours by using the sliders for the HSB, RGB, CMYK or lab colour models to set the background colour and foreground colour.
there's background colour, and you can see it up the top there. There's the foreground colour. Now let's have a look at the header bar. Let's go back to this, get that off the screen. Across the top of the workspace of an open document, there is, from the left, the home, and you can see that, the file name, which is untitled in this case, current zoom level, 61%, and then there's undo, which is the left facing arrow, and redo, the right facing arrow. Cloud docs help, which is the little cloud shape thing there, and says you're online. Well, isn't that lovely? And G is share, well that's in big lettering there, so you can see that quite clearly. H is send to, which is, you can see the box of the up arrow. Help is the question mark, and J is the app settings, and that's the app settings one there. Now A is the home back button to switch back to the home screen from the editing workspace at any time. Straight back to the home screen. And there we go, let's pull that up again. B is file name. Just there, displays the name of the file. Now I can change that name of the file that's currently open. See, I can change that, but I won't. I'll just leave that there at the moment because we don't need to mess with that. C is the current zoom level, and I can change that. Let's make it 100%. There we go. It does it instantly. D is undo. Oh, let's go back. No, I haven't got anything I can undo there yet. So all I did was change the size. Now if I want to reduce that, you can use thumb and finger. You can pinch that in and it brings it back in. That's fairly standard across most iPads. And D, undo, reverts. E is redo, restore the last action. Cloud docs help, well we did that. And G is share document. Tap the icon to share your document for collaboration and comments. H is send to. Publish, export, live stream. And I is help. Find all your help resources in one place under the help menu. There you go. You can browse through tutorials, take a tour, view gestures and shortcuts, post to the community and share feedback. And J of course is the app settings. Now we did all that. Now we've got the toolbar. A is move, move selections and layers, that one there. See how I've just moved that off to one side? Well, let's move that off and use the return button. There we go, just puts it back. B is crop and rotate. Okay, let's finish with Photoshop for the iPad right there. And the next one we'll look at is Affinity Photo for iPad. Now, for tip number two, we're going to make a selection and rasterize it by using the blend ranges. So you can see I've got the candle selected there, and I can move that around there. Let's see how we do that. And I'll actually hide that one so it's not interfering. What we do is bring our image in, and there's the candle that I've already searched for. Let's put the candle in the image. Now I want that full size, this is the tip. Remember, if you're going to rasterize something that you've got as part of another image, make sure you rasterize it as full size as you can get. Now, that's you can see the blue border behind the candle. That's the original uh, project. Now, I've got that full size. There's the image, and that's the one we just drew in. Now, we're going to just select out that image by adjusting the blend range. Now that's right down the bottom. This, that's this one here. You see this? 
that there is the blend range. Now, you watch the magic of this. We drag that down to the left-hand side. Bring that up across there. Bring that, just bringing that up across there. You can see the around the candle flame. There's the blackness. Now, I've got that so there's just a bit of a haze around that candle. But you'll notice it's also doing the bottom of the candle. It's adjusting that too. But that's pretty good. That's about where I want it. Because when I adjust that down to the right size, let's go back to the layer options. That turns off the blend mode. Now, we've got to be able to work with that. And you can see the layer options there. There's our image still there. And it's been selected out. Not this one, because that's the one we were working on before. That's not selected. This is the one we're working on now. Let's give it a name, shall we? So we don't confuse them. C-A-N-D-L-E. There we go. You can see that's now called a candle, and that layer's got the candle in it. That's the one we want. But it's not rasterized, and it's not selected. That's fine, because... If I wanted to make some adjustments to that, like uh, special effects like a Gaussian blur or a halo or something like that around it, if I were to do that as it is, that blend range down there will disappear and the image will turn black again. But what I'm going to do is, with that there selected, I'm going to add a pixel layer above it above the candle, add to the selection, so I've got both the pixel layer and the candle selected. Now I'm going to put them in a group, so that they're in a group. Nothing much has changed yet, except that you can now see that the blend range for source is now normal, because it's working with the group as the top level layer. Now we can pixelate it by rasterizing the image and I can rasterize it and trim it. And you can see now the blue handles, the bounding box, is neatly around the project. It's not spread out all over the image. You've got that one there, pixel. Now we can rename that again because this is the group, remember. We'll call this DLE candle group. So there's no mistaking it. There you go, look at that. And you can ungroup them if you had a need to. Now what you can do with the candle group, of course, is you can go to FX. Maybe I want Gaussian blur on it. Turn the Gaussian blur on. And you can do that. It's fairly abrupt as it turns out, Gaussian blur for that one. But you can do that. If that was not selected and rasterized and trimmed, that whole image would turn black as the background of the candle would not be affected anymore um, and you would have to start all over again. And there you go. You can see you've got the candle group and the special effects are in place and it's selected. That's number two. Doing a selection by using that part there. Okay, let's move right along to tip number three. Hi right, guys. Well, let's have a look at the five most common questions asked about Affinity Photo. Number one, is Affinity Photo good for beginners? Well, yes, Affinity Photo is a great choice for beginners. It has a user-friendly interface and a wide range of features that are easy to learn. Now, having said that, there are so many tutorials out there on YouTube and places like that, including mine, and also, as you can see from the right-hand image, Affinity Photo has tutorials and how to do it and ways to learn the program built right into it. Number two, should I get Lightroom or Affinity Photo? This is a very common question. 
Lightroom and Affinity Photo are both powerful image editing software apps, but they have different strengths and weaknesses. Meaning, Lightroom is better for organising and processing large numbers of photos. It will organise and process your Apple Photos library, for example, with a great deal of ease, while Affinity Photo is better for detailed image editing and composting. If you want to get down to the fine details of developing photos, images and design, then Affinity Photo is the best choice. If you want to organise your photos, Lightroom is a good choice. Is Affinity Photo better than Adobe Photoshop? How common is this question? Well, Affinity Photo and Adobe Photoshop are both excellent image editing software apps, but they have different strengths and weaknesses. Affinity Photo is generally less expensive than Photoshop, well, it's a lot less expensive than Photoshop in actual fact, and it has a more intuitive interface. However, Photoshop is more widely used in the professional industry still, although that is changing. But if you change jobs, you're likely to find that Photoshop is the, is the, um, is the app of choice in your new position. Do I need Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer and Affinity Publisher? No, you don't need all three Affinity apps. Affinity Photo is a great all-round image editing app, while Affinity Designer is a powerful vector graphic editor and Affinity Publisher is a great desktop publishing app. You can choose the app that best suits your needs. And the last one, Number five, can Affinity Photo open and save PSD files? That's Photoshop files. Yes, Affinity Photo can open and save PSD files. This makes it easy to work with files that were created in Photoshop. So you can work in one, move it to um, some form of transport, upload it to the storage, and perhaps turn up in the office where Photoshop is installed and download the file and use it there. Same file, different uh, application, that's all. Very interchangeable. Now that's the last of the five. I'm sure you have many more questions and if you do, please feel free to have a look on my YouTube channel uh, or my website where you may find the answer to your question. And of course, feel free to drop me a message. So thanks for watching. I hope you find this little um, introduction useful. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel because it helps me to keep motivated to do more. Click on the thumbs up for a like and the bell to be reminded when new videos appear. I really appreciate it. Go ahead. Make my day. Subscribe.